why do, why do we in India need to have such a strong base in semiconductors? Okay, good question to start with. Listen, semiconductor basically forms one of the foundational industries. Practically everything that we manufacture today and practically everything that we use today has semiconductors in it. Um, to put it in a very simple way, everything that is switched on, switched on and switched off has some chip in it. So if we want to grow our manufacturing base, if we want to be Atmanirbhar in manufacturing, Atmanirbhar in uh, our supply chains, have resilient supply chains, we need to have semiconductor. Now, we have a very strong semiconductor design ecosystem in our country. So it's very natural that the next uh, item in the value chain, which is semiconductor fabrication, and the third one, which is semiconductor ATMP, all the three parts of the value chain must be there in the country. And who else is better positioned than us? We have huge talent. Close to 30% of the global semiconductor talent is in India. Yeah. Recently, I had gone and met about uh, uh, 45 odd semiconductor companies. Practically every company, the CTO was an Indian expat in the valley. Right. Every Practically every R&D organization in semiconductor industry is run by Indians. Why shouldn't we have the semiconductor industry here in India? We should. Sure. And this is something which our country has been trying for more than four decades. The first attempts uh, were made in early 1960s, 1962, 65, 70s, then 80s, then 90s, 2000s, 2010s. Practically lots and lots of efforts were made and finally it is yeah. Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji who has succeeded in getting it. And it's said to actually take off in a huge way. One of the most interesting themes now is of course artificial intelligence. But then with the use of AI, whether it's in apps, there is always a danger. We keep talking about deep fakes. There is also policy which is required. Um, tell us about your concerns about the ethical use of AI and what we in India are doing, what the government is doing to ensure that that takes place. See, AI has both uh, very good, uh, uh, lots and lots of benefits and there are some serious risks, serious concerns. And the whole, con whole construct of our internet today has to be seen in that. So the way we are working on AI is, one, we need to have very strong opportunities to be created for our youth, for our, sp uh, for our startups in the new emerging field. Two, there are many applications of AI, for example, in agriculture, for example, in pharmaceuticals, in biotech, in many in uh, weather forecasting, we definitely would like to get the benefits of AI in these sectors. Three, the harms that can be caused to society, especially using deep fakes, uh, misinformation, that must be controlled and uh, I think we need a new law in this case. We, have, uh, we are uh, very widely consulting with the industry and stakeholders and right now we are in the election process so I cannot say anything, but immediately after the election process, we must uh, work on a new law on this. You spoke about misinformation very briefly. Uh, the government has been trying to push fact checkers to um, government fact checkers to ensure that what actually exists online is fair, it's, uh, it's correct. But then there is criticism in a sense of that as well with people saying that should the government necessarily be fact checking issues which may be debatable and uncomfortable for the government. How would Absolutely you respond? not. See, facts are facts, opinions are opinions. I'll give, you one, I'll give you one example. Recently, one of the opposition parties handles, they posted something on Twitter saying that uh, passenger, uh, uh, passenger transportation, passenger, number of passengers in Indian railways has reduced by 80%. Now, if somebody puts this kind of misinformation, how would you tackle it? You'll have to ask the Ministry of Railways what is the, what is the exact number, what is the accurate number. Yeah. If there is a question related to the central government, who is best placed to answer that question about the fact? Central government. If there is a question about NDTV, who's, go, who's best placed to answer Sanjay, that? Sanjay, he's sitting right there. <laughs> so it's NDTV, right? So our proposal and our notification was very limited. It was limited to facts related to data related to central government work 
that has to be clarified by the central government. If there is something related to the state governments, then the state governments have to set up their own units. Unfortunately, that has been stated by the Supreme Court. We respect Honorable Supreme Court's uh, orders, but I think it was very genuine and very well thought through idea of having one central government agency to clarify on items, on data relating to the central government ministries. I'd like to ask you now to put on your hat as Railways Minister. That's another increasingly high-tech area. One of the most um, sort of interesting and uh, areas which might result in huge economic benefits is the bullet train. We were talking about it a couple of months back. Uh, it's not really been in the news too much in the recent past. Where exactly is the bullet train and what are the economic benefits? The bullet train is uh, progressing very well. Um, as we speak, I think we have covered al almost 284 kilometers, eight uh, reverse bridges we have completed, stations are on the verge of completion. The Maharashtra section also is now progressing very rapidly. The first uh, undersea tunnel work has already started. So the progress is very good. And we should not look at bullet trains simply as a transportation project. It has to be seen from integrating economies. I'll give you the example of Japan. The first bullet train in Japan was uh, commissioned in 1960s, 1969 or 1970. Um, if you look at that bullet train, basically starting from, let's say, Tokyo, Nagoya, Kyoto, Kobe, and Osaka, these five major economies, they get integrated into one economy. Same thing will happen in India in the first uh, corridor that we are doing here. From Mumbai, Thane, Wapi, Baroda, Surat, Anand, and Ahmedabad, all these economies will become one single economy. So you can uh, have breakfast in Surat, go and complete your work in uh, Mumbai and come back and have dinner with your family in uh, the night. So that's the power of the call. And would uh, the fares undercut airfares? Most of the places wherever bullet train projects have gone, practically bullet trains have taken 90 plus percent uh, transportation share. For example, in Japan, between Tokyo and Osaka, um, I would guess it is something like 96, 97 percent by bullet train and 5% by other yeah. boats. One of your biggest um, areas of focus uh, for you and any minister, of course, uh, you know, holding the portfolio of railways is safety. Uh, this is also technology intensive. Uh, there have been systems in place to ensure uh, that there isn't any possibility of two trains coming together on the same track. But that technology hasn't been fully deployed in quite the manner in which we would like. When they, would there be 100% compliance to make us all safer in the railways. See, um, in railway, most of the large railway systems of the world, they shifted to automatic train protection when the speeds started increasing from 70s to 100. Because when you are traveling at 100 kmph, then the uh, ability for a local pilot to see the signal physically reduces dramatically because one passes in a absolutely like a very small fraction of a minute. So, around 1980s and early 1990s, most of the world's railways, they shifted to a technology called Automatic Train Protection, ATP, yes. we call it in short. Unfortunately, the governments of that period, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, and 2010, those governments, they never cared about the safety of railways. It was in 2016, when the ATP in India was approved by Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, he approved it 2016, 2016 to 2019 certification process happened. Then of course COVID came, but still a lot of work was happening in parallel. And now we have very good progress to show, close to 4,000 kilometers of, and again, it's not like uh, simply putting a device in a train. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex system. It is like setting up a complete telecom network along the railway lines, setting up many data centers along the railway lines, integrating with the signal. It's really complex. So our coverage system today, uh, we have done about 4,500 odd kilometers of uh, optical fiber cables. We have uh, done about 800 odd telecom towers already. Uh, about 600 odd uh, stations are, uh, the data centers have been prepared, station signal integration has been done. Progress is very fast, very rapid. 
and the manufacturing and design ecosystem is also getting developed. So as we speak, it's like it's, it's on the verge when we can see exponential rollout. One final question, going back to the entire issue of tech. Uh, India is seen as um, a startup phenomena in the world. Uh, we've seen uh, a startup Mahakum taking place just day before yesterday. Um, one of the most uh, one of the most impressive aspects of this is that upwards of 45% of all startups now are led by women. Uh, how is this about empowerment at so many levels? Number one, women. Number two, tier two, tier three cities. It's not just an urban phenomenon, as it were. One of the good uh, parts of the startup policy is the startup India is that we have set up many distributed incubators, which basically means that incubators are not limited to uh, a few IITs. Incubators are now spread across the country in tier two, tier three cities. Then the way our startup ecosystem has evolved in the last 10 years, the focus has been on getting real solutions, focus has been on solving real problems. And India offers basically an opportunity to uh, solve problems at population scale, where else in the world will you get an opportunity to solve something at a billion plus scale, right? And our government has uh, always focused on giving equal opportunities to women, to equal opportunities to smaller towns. In a sense, if you look at it, the basic uh, construct of technology is to democratize technology the way UPI was done. So, for example, if you look at uh, technology in many other geographies, I wouldn't take any names, technology is basically controlled by a few big tech. Whereas in India, we have created our Prime Minister Modi ji's clear focus was on democratizing technology. Technology should be accessible to everybody. It should be open, uh, open ex uh, openly accessible. It should be like uh, interoperable. So that's why most of the things that we have done, whether it is UPI, whether it is Aadhaar, whether it is uh, the, um, uh, the healthcare system that we are creating, whether it is the logistics platform that we are creating, all these are platforms where everybody can join and create solutions. So that is one of the reasons why we are seeing very good uh, traction in tier 2 and tier 3 cities and among all sections of the society. Are some companies potentially getting ahead of themselves? The reason I ask is because we've seen some big startups also failing financially now, cases against them, uh, financially floundering. In as much as we encourage this space and the sector, uh, do we need to be more cautious about what companies can and cannot achieve? Absolutely. For every business, for every enterprise, for every organization, it's very important to be uh, absolutely aware of what the legal constructs are, what the regulatory environment is, how the customers should be treated. All those things are uh, kind of basic, elementary. I think every business, whether it is in, whether it's a startup or whether it's an established business, we should all be concerned and we should all look at all the, our, in a sense, our responsibility towards the society. Minister, it's been wonderful speaking to you. Thank you very much, Thank Mr. You, Mr. Mr. for being with us. Thank you very much indeed.